for water. That's fine. Don't talk over each other. In three, <laughs> two. Daily Tech News Show is powered by you. To find out more, head to dailytechnewsshow.com slash support. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, October 6, 2017. I'm Justin Robert Young from the LA Podcast 2017 in the beautiful Biltmore Hotel in Los Angeles. Joining me is an esteemed panel. First, we have Jeff Kanata from We Have Concerns. Jeff, how you doing? I'm doing very, very well. If you, hopefully you can hear me over the crowd. It's, uh, it's a little crazy here at the LA Podcast Fest, but I'm really excited to be back on DTNS. Thanks, guys. I, how long has it been since you've been on, on the show? I don't know, but it's been a while. I'll tell you I, I think I haven't been on since my child was born, and that he's a year. So Wow. Yeah. Well, it is, it is a, a episode of illustrious returns. Uh, uh, let's get to somebody who hasn't been on in six months because he's been traveling the globe. It is Derek Kitchener back five. Hey, thanks, Rob. You know, last time I was on, it was slightly different, but I like what you guys have done with the whole LA thing. I, I don't know where Tom, I, I remember there was being uh, a Tom and a Len would illustrate. Hey, Tom, Tom, so. Tom has been briefly uh, sent to London. <laughs> you yeah. didn't send him to a farm upstate, did you? <laughs> Very <laughs> upstate. <laughs> Very uh, upstate and across the pod. And the other voice that you hear is, of course, Allison Sheridan of NoSilicast. How you doing, Allison? I'm doing good. I'm doing fine. I get to be on a lot. Yeah. Maybe you... I'm only here when people are sick. I don't no, know. no, no. You are definitely on far more than these guys. But today we have all united uh, uh, to take over for the fact that both Tom and Sarah are not here. But we will do our best in their stead. Uh, of course, big shout out to our producer, Roger Chang, who is also helping things out. But first, let's start with a few tech things you should know. The AOL Instant Messenger will be discontinued December 15th after 20 years of operation in a notice posted on the AIM help page. <laughs> Which, I mean, who is going to the AIM help page? Search it every day. Uh, stated services will end on December 15th and all data will be deleted. Uh, users with an at AIM.com email address will, however, still be able to receive email. Mr. Funk 02 was my first AIM. <laughs> oh, that's uh, so bad you couldn't get in there a little earlier and get that first funk. Uh, uh, I mean, listen, there was a reason why. 02 had no other reason other than there was already a Mr. <laughs> funk. Uh, and my there, father is Mr. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Uh, uh, any, any fond AIM memories? That's my first thing I was going to say was I'm just really happy it's dying so Ray Moosehead can just go away forever and I'll can, never have to explain can it. Can clomp off into the ether. <laughs> it's gone to the farm upstate with GeoCities. Hopefully it will live on somewhere on archive.org. Actually, hopefully not. Oh, good question. Uh, I actually am very excited for the idea. I think we should all just get back on AIM until it's not. Well, it's just that yeah, 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 surge of popularity. Just gigantic. Well, let's make AOL reconsider. Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> I would love, as, as a nostalgia trip from now until December 15th, that'd, that'd be amazing. amazing. All like, times. At all times. Uh, yes. <laughs> if, if everybody in chat realm did this right now, you yeah. know, the AIM would be like, oh my god, we've got like a 900% <laughs> improvement in our uh, uptake. The problem they is, keep I, it around. I don't know if I could get a hold of a 700 hour CD in order to get some time oh, back on AOL. Yeah. Boy, uh, I will point. say this, if you look at AIM and the kind of social networks that have broken out past that, if you look at how big chat is just in general, uh, Twitter effectively being AIM away messages, but having that be the product, there's a, a real case to say that AIM is one, AIM is one of the most influential social yeah. products ever. 100%. I've seen so much snark online after this announcement came out, but you can't help but admit that AIM was, it was the game changer. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 was the thing, at least for me. You know, yeah. like, that, that was the pre-Facebook Facebook of just like leaving, uh-oh, or it was, it wasn't, uh-oh, it was, <laughs> boop, boop. I no, 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 it was like, it was the, the door opening. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, you would walk by, you would walk through the halls in the dorms, and then you would just hear that over and over and over. Oh, yeah, oh, no, no, yeah, yeah, with the one person who'd never turned down their speakers. <laughs> <laughs> or no, just went for blank sublime again to be like, just leave it on for the AOL it's the messenger. And in so many good times with the cross-site scripting on that, I've just got to say, like, there was a lot of fun that could be had, considering it was just an HTML processor. 
Um, yeah, good, good times hacking AIM. <laughs> and and, I, and I'm, I'm afraid that it, it is probably that the whole thing is running on a Windows NT4 server, and they're like, oh, you know, we just we gotta, we just gotta put this thing down. Oh, yeah. there's, there's no upgrading, and we just gotta take it to the farm out back. Are there even any clients left for this? You asking the wrong guy. Yeah. <laughs> I think both of them are upset. Yes. <laughs> Uh, another thing you need to know this morning is Blizzard debuted a beta version of its Battle.net program that offers offline mode and many social features including group text and voice chat. This to me is Blizzard taking aim at Discord, taking yep. aim at Steam eventually as well with Destiny 2 coming on to the Blizzard platform on PC. I think they are making a big push to own that space. But I just downloaded Discord today. Is, is it over already? No, it's not over. Oh, I, but I will tell you that my friends and I actually prefer the, the Blizzard app right now. It is, it is robust. It's easy to use. In, in, in all five hours that it's been out? You no, 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 no. I mean, no, we, for months we've been using it. This okay. is just a beta with some new features. And yeah. they've, they've had a client that's a great, a great voice chat. Uh, and we use that to play non-Blizzard games all the time. We just turn it on in the background and, and use that like we would use Discord. But, so but this, this is something that uh, Blizzard is very careful about what they come out with that's part of their brand is that they, they do add that extra kind of level of, of polish. Do you think that this does significant damage to Discord, which is gaming forward? I think this is the first step of getting there, yeah. right? This is adding features that are necessary to be a contender in that space, um, groups, and I think making it more like an Xbox Live or a PlayStation Network where your group exists beyond the confines of any specific game and it exists across a whole range of games and all of that stuff that you need to have appear offline, all those things that are just sort of basic requirements to make this everybody's day-to-day -day chat client when they're gaming, they're doing. So yeah. is the, do you think that that's where uh, the, the value will be only in gaming for that though? Or is that all it's targeted towards? Because Discord is not just for gaming, right? right. And it, it, they just primarily. Have, it's I mean, I think they get most yeah. of their user base from people that game, but I'm sure there are a lot of people that don't. They yeah. just added uh, video and voice chat today for everybody, and when we installed it, it said, hey, can we take a look at your Skype contacts? And we said, sure. And I don't know how it got them, because I used a different username, but it must have got by email, and it knew all of my contacts. Mr. Funko, too. Yeah, I got Mr. Funko too. It was the first. All time. right, I'll tell you what. Here are some more uh, top stories. Yeah, wait, hold on. Let's try that one more time. Mm, well, I'll tell you what. Uh, imagine what it's like. uh, After privacy, after privacy scrutiny, Mattel has canceled its upcoming Aristotle Smart Home Hub aimed at children. Uh, originally announced at CES. The device spurred a 20,000 signature petition from the Campaign for a Commercial Free Childhood, as well as a bipartisan letter from two members of Congress. Aristotle, Aristotle was designed to be bundled wi -Fi, a bundled Wi-Fi camera to monitor children, adjust ambient uh, lighting and noise based on behavior, and include advanced functions like answering children's questions and teaching the alphabet. Let's so. <laughs> In September 2016, Mattel agreed, along with Hasbro, to stop online child tracking, and then they immediately start doing this. Well, this I think it's child here. tracking so much as it's sure. virtual parenting, so you can not parent your child. While they, re <laughs> while they record all of the data. I thought that was more of an indoctrination thing, which is why I heard in other news that the Borg Collective was coming out with their own uh, home hub, <laughs> smart hub, right? Uh, they've got the spokesperson, Lacutus of Borg. It's, it's all about like getting them early. Uh, well, let me, let me ask you this, because uh, uh, we have two parents here, uh, and uh, I would guess that this uh, product would be more at uh, Jeff's uh, and child's age. I don't know. I don't, I don't, my grandson is maybe the same age. Yeah, I was going to say, maybe you want to keep track of your adult children, though. Who knows? Maybe they're, uh, you know. Uh, but this is, this is more uh, to be in the child's room and for a, a parent to be able to keep an eye on them right. at all times. Where is that line for you guys in terms of, I want to have all available uh, uh, tools to monitor my child, and this is getting a little bit too invasive and creepy, and I don't want my child around it. I mean, I don't know. We have, we have a camera that is a closed circuit camera that we use when my child sleeps. I think most parents do nowadays have some sort of monitoring system. Uh, the idea that it's just connected to your Wi-Fi network and maybe connected back to Mattel, I think is the one that feels yeah. weird, right? Yeah. To have with it with their history, especially, because they've screwed this up before. With, I mean, look what they did to Barbie. <laughs> 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 and 
we'll just leave that one there. <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 this isn't one of those things that gives me the heebie-jeebies, but I certainly understand why it does for other people. It's not a product that I would rush out and buy, but I, I, and I understand why people think that it's a bridge too far. I, I think that this probably would have gone out and done well if it weren't for people who care about privacy and security coming in and saying, no, 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 no. Because, I mean, how many of those uh, webcams have sold with the uh, hard-coded passwords in them, right? Yeah. yeah, this already exists, and you can troll through the Shodan database right now and pull up many cams that yep. are just completely exposed to the internet, which is creepy and terrifying all at the same time. Well, I was, I was proud of my daughter when I, I called her up and I said, say, you know that webcam you've got? Throw it away, and she, I told her why, and she said, yep. You got rid of it, but you know, the, the everybody that, doesn't know about it. Right? The thing that's more, the, the other side of this that nobody's really talking about that I think is the, sort of the tip of the iceberg for some thing that's going to be happening in the next five or ten years is it had functionality where the kid could talk to it and ask it questions. Mm -hmm. and we're going to see more and more of that as Siri's and Alexa's and all that. Well, things. I mean, that, that to me is where I think something like this is going to come along and not have the problems that this particular product had. And, and whether it be because a company will be smarter than Mattel and rolling it out and, and really catering to the uh, you know the, the parents that, that shouldn't be worrying about it but should instead be looking at it as like a resource. But when kids are talking to Alexa now, right? Yeah. You know, I mean, at like, that point, uh, how point. is this? I mean, this is basically just a, a Teddy Ruxpin. I was Alexa about to say thing. exactly yeah. that. Like put a put an Amazon Alexa in a Teddy Ruxpin. Call it a day. When they came out, when they came out with the uh, the show, that one cracked me up because they said, "Yeah, like you can use it as a as a baby monitor." It had an ankle tilted up, and so I pictured you'd have to put your kid in one of those nets that you keep the stuffed animals in up on the ceiling. That's where you keep them, right? Overhead bins, yeah, exactly. right? or the seat in front of you. I, I can't remember. One of those. Yes. So get this, guys. Security researcher Will Schaefer discovered that Uber had granted undocumented app features in iOS allowing it to access screen recording. Uh, these are undocumented entitlement features with special permissions from Apple. And according to Schaefer's library of app binaries, Uber is only the third, uh, is the only third-party app granted screen recording entitlement. Uber acknowledged this and said that the entitlement was uh, stated that it was used to improve the screen rendering for the their watch app. So why panic? <laughs> panic! Get another uh, uh, stab at the heart of uh, the public trust by the villainous Uber. You're not going to believe what Uber did to Barbie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, why would they have granted that to, to Uber of all people? Well, I, I think this is people. this is one of those, uh, as as Tom likes to say, fun busting uh, uh, opportunities. As much as obviously the narrative, and rightfully so, is there for Uber to be playing the heel. Uh, this is a entitlement that was granted when they were building their watch app, and as uh, you know, Darren uh, very kind of uh, uh, eloquently put, there is a lazy but understandable reason why Apple would say this is okay. Well, you, you know, you've got to you know, you want to wow people with it. Hey, we got a, you know this app that's really great and useful, but on the back end, you've got to build out all the infrastructure and APIs and stuff to make those things work. And when you're really trying to just rush these things to market and be like, hey, check it out, our smartwatch has the Uber, you're like, okay, now how do we get the video from the screen to the to the watch e most easily? Oh, just give them that API. We've already got one. Yeah. So effectively, if, if you have ever used Uber on your Apple Watch, uh, it shows you where your car is coming from. It, it gives you that, that screen grab. That's how they got it onto your so watch. Is it, but is it real time watching it move? You know, I can't remember how whether it was it was a, a screen grab. It shows you how long it's been since I've used the Uber uh, Apple Watch app. But uh, for the five seconds that uh, I did until I realized it was a lot harder than just putting out my phone. <laughs> right, right. Uh, uh, the, the, there was that functionality, and I think that this is something where the Uber has obviously done themselves no favors in terms of their reputation. There's a reason why their CEO is no longer their CEO, and we have a new CEO now. Uh, but this does not. But, but it's funny that in this context, it's like, oh, why is Uber getting this and nobody else? And that's the conversation rather than why did Apple yeah, give it to Apple Uber and not anyone else? else? I think it's an obvious answer to, to both, which is Apple was making a watch and they needed apps. And Uber was a big, one of those big high profile apps that you would and want we didn't on know a watch, watch. Yet. Yeah. Well, and, and the, the, the selling point of 
the Apple Watch and smartwatches in general and apps on smartwatches are those one button apps. Right? right. Like, I want food, hit a button. I want to ride, hit a button. Yeah. And so I can imagine the conversation within Uber and their development team was something like this with Apple. Like, hey, so we're building out the uh, Uber app. We want to be like a launch app on the, uh, the new watch. Listen, um, we're trying to get the screen from here to there. And we're not seeing anywhere in the watch API how to do that most effectively. So it's a good user experience. And Apple going, OK, listen, we got this internal thing. We're just going to give it to you guys. Yeah, and the time, the time period was really compressed to, to get apps on the, the watch to launch. But I, but I had a question about that. If they could do that, why couldn't they use that exact API to get the interstitial screen from Wi-Fi networks onto the uh, Apple Watch 3? So that if they can take that video at real time, send it to the watch, and then you could tap it, wouldn't that be something that would allow them to get past that problem they're having with Apple Watch 3? That's a really, really good point. <laughs> the developer somewhere is like shaking their head. I know. <laughs> All respect to this app, they just haven't implemented it. Right, right. But they didn't give themselves the internal thing that they wanted, mm -hmm. right? Wow. Well, moving on, a UK financial filing shows that Alphabet's AI DeepMind subsidiary generated 40.2 40 million pounds in revenue in 2016, but lost an overall a total of 123.5 million pounds. DeepMind had, a dis had to disclose earnings under UK law as it is still registered there as a private company. Expenses were dominated by staffing and related costs of 104.7 million pounds. DeepMind is ordinarily lumped into Alphabet's other betas in earnings reports, which lost a total of $3.77 billion in 2016. So DeepMind is uh, Google's uh, the, you know, neural net AI kind of uh, play. Uh, you, you've read about it a lot, and we've talked about it a lot on this show. Did you think it'd be making money by now? I wouldn't have expected yeah, so it. So next-gen technology, you know, you really got to sink a lot into the, the early days of these things. It's like saying, like, oh, why isn't Uber making money? <laughs> exactly. Right? I mean, we're in shallow mine right now. Did yeah, you, uh, go did you ever think they did a Barbie, though? <laughs> I think what they need to do though is like say like okay okay so we've developed it thus far now let's just like launch the deep mind at the New York Stock Exchange see if the the AI can make itself some money you know see if it's a self-sustaining thing. Well, I mean, I, I I do think that this is interesting, and the reason why it's a news story is because uh, Google hides this kind of stuff normally, as we pointed out here, that it's normally oh, in okay. a it's much just larger to know. file. So this is. Uh, to me, the story here is that it is not losing as much money as as one might guess. Right, you know? right. I was surprised by the generated revenue part. Yeah, no, I mean, not by the loss part, right? Yeah. Like, what are they getting more money from? <laughs> well, what is DeepMind doing that's making money? Right, they're, they're licensing <laughs> it to Google. No, no. I, I think that my takeaway from here was like, oh, you know what? I think that Alphabet breakout was actually a really good idea because they can take those. I don't want to say losers. But those like up and coming things that they're really gonna take a long time to kind of like you know have that fireworks moment. Well, I mean, uh, DeepMind is something. There are a lot of players in this game right now, mm -hmm. and and there are some like Watson that has a, a more recognizable brand. Uh, they need for every time you hear DeepMind to think miracle. They want you to think, oh, it beat this Go player. Like right. it, it did this amazing thing. It, it's going to compete in esports. Uh, it's 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 you know look what it's doing to Barbie. Uh, there's just so much. This would be so much better if there were people to laugh at each other. Tell it me, man. Uh, <laughs> uh, the uh, uh, and that's why they got. I mean, it, it makes sense to hide it, right? But uh, uh, it is interesting to see how far along it is. It is going, and also it's curious to see. You know, this is what it is. You know, doing in, in the UK, who knows where it's doing elsewhere. Yeah. Uh, the Wall Street Journal has sources who say Russian government agents copied information from an NSA contractor's home computer in 2015 by exploiting vulnerabilities in the Kaspersky antivirus. The information pertained to the NSA's methods of network penetration and defense of its own networks. This is bad. The incident was discovered in the spring of 2016, according to the journal, and DTNS listener MB noted that Google's Travis Ormandy identified vulnerabilities in Kaspersky software in 2015. Last month, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security directed all federal agencies to stop using Kaspersky software, not immediately, but within 90 days. Sure. You know, you gotta, you gotta let it, it takes a while to uninstall things. Now, now Darren's going to have actual uh, 
intelligent uh, <laughs> context for this. Uh, but I'm going to step in front of this just to, just to bring the context of this show. This is something that we've talked uh, quite a lot about, and specifically the idea that right now, if let's say you were uh, in the security field, in, in, the, in the, the, the government sphere, now would be the time when you would want to try to attack a Russian uh, security company because of how the political climate is. We have uh, cast a little bit of a skeptical eye towards some of the criticism towards Kaspersky, but I would think this represents something a little bit more concrete uh, uh, to, to say that, well, maybe there is a a problem here. Now, Darren, example to which we could am, I, am, I, am I off base, or, or uh, is this still uh, something that we need to look at uh, critically? Well, you, you know, you're looking to me for some intelligent discourse, and I had literally written down in Soviet Russia, antivirus infects you. So, <laughs> riffing on that, I would say yeah. that, no, it, it's, Furthermore. I, I do believe that there's a little bit of a witch, I, I see what you're saying as far as like witch hunt stuff, yes. you know, there's a lot of like, oh, Everybody loves I, I, a good I'm not, done it. I mean, I'm not saying it's a witch hunt because there's so much of this that is that is beyond what any of us can know. I'm just saying that it's a good environment for a witch hunt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and the same thing is witch hunt adjacent. Yeah, yeah. it's just, you know it's a witch hunting season. Pumpkin spice lattes. Like, yeah, I think that the same could be held true as far as uh, like Huawei. Right, the you know, yeah. Congress are the same thing Absolutely. about those. I think that that's actually showing like a sea change of distrust of like um, you know not made here kind of mentality. Like, was it the worst thing here though that the NSA guy took his work home? Well, okay, actually, you know, that's can I take a little hat on that one for Please. a moment because this is like you know if Russia really wanted some NSA docs from contractors, all they really needed to do was wait until next year because those leaks from contractors are like an annual occurrence now, right? Yeah. Um, so. To take a little hat for a moment, I, if I were the NSA, I'd be like, ooh, opportunity for a honeypot. Let's send the uh, contractor home with a treasure trove of misinformation, because then we can analyze how the Russian hackers break in and potentially validate whether or not the allegations of conspiracy being compromised by the Kremlin are true. And we clearly can't drink the poison in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> I really like your optimism on that, that maybe that's uh, what's actually going on. Yeah, it comes back to the whole, like, uh, you know, whether or not the NSA is actually some, like, crazy big brother with technology from aliens that we could never imagine, or if they're just like the DMV. Are, are yes. we disturbed at all that it took them from 2015 to 2016, some span of time there, to it, discover it this? Uh, they move at the speed of government. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we just found out that Yahoo got hacked like 14 years ago. So. <laughs> well, and then the I mean, rest of the you for AIM it was really easy to hack back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're gonna find out all my messages to Mr. Funk too. <laughs> oh, two. Come on, oh, two. Uh, Google Fiber <laughs> announced that its upcoming launch in Louisville and San Antonio uh, markets uh, it will offer only internet service with no TV baggage. Last year, Google announced that Fiber would halt future deployment, making these two markets the last two confirmed commitments to roll out the service. So before uh, before the show, we were uh, chatting in the green room. And uh, the guy behind us was actually listening to us talk about this, and he, t he called me over and he said, I used to work, work uh, Google infrastructure. And I said, oh, so why do they do something like that? Why do they stop doing something like, like Google Fiber? And his answer was really interesting. He said, you know, it's been a few years since I've been there, but he said, it's, the thing about them is they've got a couple of scientists that are leading the company, and if they read about something new, they're gonna go do that. And Google Fiber isn't sexy, it isn't new, it isn't the thing that's five years out, it is the thing everybody already knows how to do, so they're bored with it and they move on. And I thought that was a, a, an interesting answer, it wasn't what I actually expected. Well, I mean, there's also the fact that it uh, didn't seem to be profitable. Uh, uh, laying fiber is, is very, very expensive, it involves a lot of regulation, it involves fighting uh, very entrenched money interests, and although it was, for its time, this... Uh, uh, you know, imaginary hero that was going to come over the hill and rescue us from uh, right. Uh, right. We would point to this and say, "Look, so, competition." So well said. Exactly. What but I wasn't that their stated goal? Yeah. yeah, that's their stated goal at the beginning. Was like, we're not interested in making this a business. We're interested in in giving people an impetus to create it for their business. And then, right? and, and, then, then and then, lo, 
the publicly traded company, he started saying, wow, wait, this isn't really a good business at all. It's like not a business, a political protest, like uh, uh, infrastructure thing, I don't but know. Even the, like looking further back at infrastructure, this is actually typical of Google, if you remember the 700 megahertz spectrum auctions, yep. where they were increasing the bid, increasing the bid, uh, and then ultimately getting the FCC to put in place certain regulations where ultimately Verizon won, but they had to abide by certain things that Google was able to get in there by which was making, good for us, which was good for us. Consumers. So potentially, you know, this Google Fiber thing, maybe this was the, the you know, the, the long plan after all was to disrupt uh, uh, the market in such a way that it changes some regulations in ways that we haven't just seen that that was actually the plot all along. Well, the, the problem is, is that this kind of infrastructure deployment is so regional. You know, everything is city by city, and ultimately that's why it's so expensive, is that it's not like you can just win, you know, a, a portion of the country, right? You can't just right. go like, all right, we, we quartered up the country, and now you get to do the Northeast, and now you get to do the Southeast, or the, or the Northwest. You have to go and deal with every city government, and deal with every regulation, and, figure out exactly how that's going to go. My buddy just got AT&T fiber installed here in Los Angeles, uh, and I'm insanely jealous because he has gigabit ethernet, and I looked, and I am also a resident of Los Angeles, but not close enough to get, well, it doesn't work at would, my house. Yeah. Would he have gotten AT&T gigabit fiber had uh, Google, had Google, Google not Google. started with the whole, uh, you know, I don't believe so. Right. I think you're right. I think I think it's to their credit that this exists at all. Yeah. Oh, if you if you look at specifically the cities where Google did roll out fiber, it was almost oh, overnight. Yeah. yeah. All of a sudden, everybody. Uh, oh, we could never roll out gigabit fiber. It'd be impossible. What they're doing right now? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Actually, we've got a ton of you. Oh my dirt god. Dirt fiber. They turned on. They yeah, already so, had it there. So now. crazy that you were doing that because oh. we were like literally. The guy should have the truck right now. Uh, this is. Funny well, story. This is already on the way. I remember hearing. <laughs> hey guys, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, go ahead and subscribe to the dailytechheadlines.com. Uh, you know, uh, we can get into our, our discussion here since we are at the LA Podcast Festival and we have all been doing podcasts up here on this uh, dais for a pretty long time. It feels like that up here on that dais. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure you leave time for uh, questions from the audience. Uh, uh, is, is, is starting a podcast now, do you think like, harder or easier than it was 10 years ago? I'll start with, uh, start with you, Allison. Well, I started mine 12 years ago, and I sat down and, and, and read someone else's XML to try to figure out how do I type in the RSS, you know, sure. create the RSS feed by hand. So that's a little bit easier. Yeah. Um, I look back and I see what other people are doing. I go, man, I'm still doing a lot of this the hard way, but I know this makes the show come out every single week. Um, the, the tools are the big thing, but it, as we were joking around beforehand, I'm pretty sure it's not the tools that are actually the hard part of doing a podcast, right? I mean, it's, it's, the, it's the commitment, it's the time, it's the passion, it's getting guests to show up. All those are really the harder parts. And, in those ways, I don't think that's probably ever going to change. I would agree that the landscape has completely changed, but some of the core things stay the same. Obviously, the technology has changed because when we started, you know, 10 years ago or more, uh, it was all about BitTorrent and RSS. And yes, the landscape has changed, but you're right about the commitment. That hasn't changed. The amount of passion and time that you have to put into something uh, stays consistent. The things that are different and, and uh, you know, other than the technology is the ways that you build audience and you grow audience and you interact with audience. Um, and those present some unique challenges, and we'll talk about those as far as like how that has changed. Um, yeah. What would you say? I, I was just gonna, I was going to say that is the single biggest thing that changed for me. It didn't make it harder; it made it easier. Is in in 2005, I was sitting alone in a room with a microphone. Now I'm still sitting alone in a mic in a room with a microphone, but I don't feel alone because I've got a live chat room while I'm doing the recording. And it's real stupid. I mean, they talk about the dumbest things. But wait, people you know, talk about dumb things on IRC. I know it's, <laughs> it, it, they talk about Barbie a lot. I'm not sure what happened, but something <laughs> happened. But but that to me made the job easier and so much more fun because the community, right. the, the community stuff, is crazy fun now. Well, it's it's interesting because it's it's almost two different questions, right? Is it is it easier to start a podcast? Yeah, it's so much easier because there's so many tools as you guys have outlined. But what the real question is, what do you want out of the podcast? Right? Yeah. Are you trying to make a living? Are you trying to make money? Are you trying to have a big audience? What What is it that you're looking for f by starting your podcast? And I think 
all of us can agree that it's, it's, it's very easy now to get a podcast, put it out there, and have someone listen to it. That is much more simple than it has ever been. Because well, let, our, let me, our audience let me, let, me, let, me, let me actually uh, just spin off of something that you said. Is it more, is it easier now than it was when you started to make a living doing a podcast or hard? Well, when, we, when I started, there were like, you know, a dozen people making a living doing a podcast. So it, 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 it what year did you get in? Uh, 2005. Okay, yeah. Yeah. So, or 2006, I guess, technically. Um, but there are more people doing it, but that there's also a much bigger fragmentation. Of, of, there's a bigger pie, but it's also smaller slices of that pie. So I think there's probably more ways, more places that are willing to give money and more things like Patreon existing. Patreon is a huge right, thing. Right. That, oh my God, if that had existed ten years ago, you know, my life would be completely different. We'd be with thousands. <laughs> yeah, uh, but also there are uh, networks of people that whose whole job is, is it is to find ads for podcasts. All those things. That infrastructure didn't exist back then, but also it's a much more crowded place. So rising above just the is in that, oh, if that's the story. It's true. For, 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 oh, yes, but it, but it's always been true. Right? Of, all, of all entertainment. I mean, I, I, no, I, I, right. no, no, well, podcasts specifically. I right. remember. I, we can say like, oh, well, we got in like right place, right time, 2005. The same people can say like, oh man, I'm really glad I got in in 2010 before it blew up. Everyone oh man, I'm so glad I got in in 2014. I got in the beginning of podcasting. That's true. Mark Barron's like, I'm the first podcaster. Exactly. I was doing it for five years, bro. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I remember when, when Kevin Smith launched his podcast. I'm like, oh, shame he got in after the boom. You know, like, <laughs> exactly. new guy. Yeah. I think he could have done well. Yeah. I remember for the fact that everybody already has listened to all the podcasts the level that they all listen to. You make a great point, and and that is, I think that. The horizon is even larger. There is a huge untapped audience yeah. of people that will enjoy long form content like this that's deep and engaging and interesting and mostly ad free. All of that stuff I think is, is, is right for a much larger audience. But I also think with that potential, I think it marginalizes amateur voices more. I think that what you see in the top 200 podcasts now, for the most part, are famous people that are already famous from another media. Right. What? Well, you know, yeah, because, because, yes, Leo, always, Leo has always been answering that question. How do you get a, a successful podcast? He says, "Well, first, have a syndicated television show for right. five years, right. and then." Yeah. No, I, it's true. I, yes, and then you have these slipstreams like talking about murder, right? I mean, and show and up out of nowhere. Then all of a sudden, you can have literally no experience and and have zero profile. Are you talking about like uh, are you talking? About an NPR show? Is that what you No, no, I'm talking about one of the headliners here at oh, this show, uh, 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 My Favorite Murder, which uh, was, you know, a, a, a somebody who was a writer for, like, Mr. Show, but, but by and large didn't have much of a, oh, okay. a, a profile. And, but and if it hadn't been for the NPR podcast about murder, I'm not sure that would have been a hot problem. I'm sure it's murder I mean, always no, But, I mean, like, you know, listen, uh, the, the, the Discovery ID channel exists, and, and all these true crime things. True crime is something that's kind of come and gone for popular culture. Uh, I guess, absolutely, it will always give you an advantage to have, specifically in where we are now in culture, as the monoculture has completely shattered, so anything that everybody or a larger group of people can touch back on and say, oh, I remember him, he's the this guy, now right. he does this. Like, right. he's the fear factor guy, now he talks about doing DMT and <laughs> uh, interviewing UFC. Athletes, right? Uh, uh, that will always give you an, an, uh, a leg up, right? But there is still, I think, a solid amount of, of podcasting that is what was kind of the initial promise. Uh, right. That start Definitely. start a show, build an audience, and hey, kid, we'll, we'll make you famous, and you can re you too can read ads for Nature Box. <laughs> as far as like, yeah, exactly. As far as uh, you know, uh, how the industry has changed and like new podcasts coming to to garner huge audiences. One of the ones that I think about uh, more recently is Hello Internet, which comes out of CPG Gray, which would, who made a name as a YouTuber, and then out of that, sort of like also making podcasts. And the, the, the YouTube thing is like that short form, you know, four yeah. or five minute catchy thing, and then it's like, oh, well, you might as well, you know, you've got a, a ravenous audience that's looking for those things that take forever to produce. 
So Darren, what you're saying is uh, how to get into podcasting, see also my panel on how to get into YouTubing. <laughs> well, actually, no, but to that effect, I will say that when people ask what I do and I try to say I'm a podcaster, they give you this weird blank look and I'm just like, I'm a YouTuber. And they're like, oh, you're a YouTuber. Oh, I don't do that stuff, man. I don't even, I don't even, I don't see, even I, I don't Wait, what do, you, what do you do? What do you, what do you say? Uh, I say I, I host stuff. I talk about tech. I talk about entertainment. I, I say internet radio show. Oh, that's good. And they, that's they seem good. to understand that. But I'm noticing people don't do that cock in the head anymore. And it was ever since, uh, what is it? What was it called? Disclosed? Disclosed? And what was the original Zero. one? Zero. 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 Zero was the first one. Since then, people okay. seem to know what a podcast is. I find that the second I use that that word, podcast, it's the conversation. Is. Ways. Right. In fact, I remember it was actually just recently cleaning up hackfraud.org, which is like a WordPress install from 2005 that I can't believe is still going. But I found the old blog roll, and in it was a list of all of the places that we sent people to back in 2005. And it was like techtainment.net and vidcast.org, and both of those are great examples of they were literally a blog that would list the new video that just hit the internet. Oh man, every time there was a new video on the internet. Oh, wow. We put, we put oh, uh, awesome. uh, I had a comedy group that put our, our uh, sketches on Adam Films, because that's, there was no YouTube. Right. Yeah. We put out stuff on, you know, just aggregators. That's all it was. And, and at the time, there was this big debate like, oh, well, what is this? Video that's a podcast, is it? And then people are calling them vidcasts and IPTV and IPTV. Oh. And yet now, like it's Hashtag really just easier to say I make videos on the internet. Hashtag old enough to remember. Uh, uh, all right, well here. I, I have a question for you guys. Can I? Sure. I mean, it's wild, kind of crazy. I'm gonna. It's not no, on the agenda. Go nuts. Yeah. Okay. No. So, have you found that once you started doing podcasting, you sort of pull? Plural, I lost the word, proliferated into other podcasts, creating more of your own. They sort of, they seem to spawn each other. Are you guys having that I problem? think that's a question for Justin. You know, <laughs> I mean, uh, I don't know about you, but uh, <laughs> No, I mean, part of uh, uh, the making a living in podcasting thing is, uh, you know, making a lot of them. And, yeah. and, and also just figuring out, you know, just scratching that lotto ticket and seeing whether or not your guess on what the audience wants, the way that you're building your show, the people that you're uh, that are on the show with you, how the audience is responding, how long it is, whether or not all your guesses on that are right, and they're never right, so then you gotta change it a little <laughs> bit, right? And then you see whether or not that right, that that's good and that's right, and then if it isn't, then you gotta shut it down. And sometimes that's a longer process and you wind up doing a lot of them or they're of, of a certain level of success and it just makes sense to keep doing it. But uh, I would not be able to make a living if I didn't do this 7,000 podcasts that I do every yeah. week. I tell my wife, uh, a lot of little things add up to one reasonable thing. Yep. And that's that's how I make a living. Uh, but, but yeah, no, I, I think that there is, once you figure it out, and also part of it's like, you know, why would we build this television station if we're not gonna do, you know, a bunch of television shows, right? Like there's, when you have the equipment and you have the know-how, uh, I think absolutely there is a, a drive to just keep going and making more. So I don't do it for a living, but I do it, I just can't stop doing it. I, yeah. my, my shows get too big and then I break them off into more shows. Mm -hmm. So they just, I, I'm afraid that 10 years from now I'm going to have 20 shows, but I'm too, because they just keep spawning. You're going to be like, they show up by crazy, themselves. Like crazy podcast lady. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just, like podcasts all over oh, my like, shows. Yeah. I know I left it. They could sometimes my shows crawl under the furniture. <laughs> All right, Allison, let me, let me ask you this, and we'll go down the road here. Uh, what's the biggest change you've noticed from when you started, and what is the biggest change you see happening going forward? Ooh, the, the second part will be hard, because I'm really bad at forecasting anything into the future. Um, the biggest change for me was definitely the community stuff. We've, uh, Steve and I have become friends with people all over the world. We've, we've traveled uh, to Europe to meet people, to, to New Zealand and met people uh, because of the podcast. So uh, I, I talk a lot to my human real life friends. They say, oh, well, the internet, you know, those aren't real friends. I said, well, no, I've gone to Ireland to meet them. I've gone to, to oh, sure, uh, you yeah. know, I've done, gone all these places. And even the people I've never met in real life, we're really good friends with this guy, Kevin. He lives in, in Virginia. We know his children. We know what they like, what they do. We know his wife. We know where he lives. We stalking him practically, but it is a real friendship. And that's something I just absolutely didn't see happening in that. Um, as far as going forward, I am 
literally the worst predictor of the future in technology of all times. I actually said that you'd never need anything bigger than the screen on a 512K Mac. Okay, I, I, I said. All right, and I jury's still out. The jury's <laughs> still out. I, and I also said uh, you'd never need color. There's no reason for color. So I'm not going to take that second question. Uh, uh, okay, good, good, uh, <laughs> good, good punt, Darren. I would say that the when we very first got into this, it really felt like a sea change of like the the, the origins, the um, the passion of the internet was coming out in ways that that we call it all about the open web. You know, using uh, content distribution with BitTorrent and other open source technology, and using RSS feeds and things that really democratized. Uh, the media. In fact, that was actually the big word back then was the democratization of media. And we look at where it is now, and I see like it, it's very difficult to try to like you know it was hard back then to explain to people. And I feel like there was an uptake in like RSS and such, and then there was like that drop off again, where now it's like oh wait that isn't an app, and the app has become like the YouTube Reds of the world or the, the Facebook Walled Gardens of the world, where it's like okay well. I'm gonna go take a flight, let me download some stuff on YouTube Red, rather than download it uh, on an RSS feed with a podcatcher. It feels like there's much more uh, walled gardens and less of the open web that, that started this. And do you think that that gets more or less over the next five years? Uh, I think it gets more, but I think uh, as unfortunate as it is, it actually garners a larger audience, just that ease of use factor. Yeah. So there's, I think there's still opportunities for, you know, a, a uh, um, a open web experience to harness that same magic yeah. that the Facebooks and YouTubes of the world have done. I just haven't seen it yet. Jack? I think for me the biggest difference, we kind of talked about this a little bit already, is Patreon, quite frankly. Huh. Uh, because, uh, so I can do that. yeah, when you, when you, you know, podcasting started and it was like, oh my gosh, anybody can do this, but there's really no way to make money unless you link together and figure out a way to sell ads. Blah, 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 blah. It's, it, there was still an intermediation that happened, a a, a walled garden, a gated thing that there were gatekeepers, right? That said, you can't do this unless we can. You can sell nature boxes, for example. Exactly, and and that specific uh, problem, I think, really only got worse because once podcasting was new, you had a lot of you know just like feelers of, of companies that were like, yeah, let's spend a little money on this. Let let's just try yeah. to toss a little cash in there, and then it didn't quite pan out, and it didn't quite grow fast enough, and then that sort of came back and all of a sudden, this is what I like to call for anybody who's listened to a lot of podcasts, the Netflix and Audible era. Oh yeah, yeah. we so, sold Netflix like heck on, on TRS, man. Exactly, and the reason why was because there weren't a lot of Ford, Microsoft, you know, right. uh, Bounty, Paper Towel, you know, uh, kind, of, kind of stuff that want to do, big companies that wanted to go do it. So the, the companies that were willing were either right in the demo Right. You are cutting edge, you are spending money on stuff, you have disposable income. And you're on the internet. And we are maybe going to pay you a little bit, but we're really going to try and sell you on the future of this, which is you get a cut whenever anyone signs up. Right. And that was low risk advertising that could be blanketed all over a ton of podcasts. And now you've seen a little bit as the pie has gotten bigger, you've seen a little bit more of, of at least new companies come in. I really thought it was going to go to somebody figuring out micropayments. That's what I thought was going to happen. So again, I'm wrong. But I thought somebody would come up with this way that we would all just get a piece of it with micropayments with different, that. Different colored ones. I, yeah, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, all right. Well, I'll tell you what. I'm glad that we've solved, we've charted the complete history and uh, total future of okay. podcasting. Uh, uh, as a mom would be proud, <laughs> foundation style. We've totally nailed it. Uh, let's go ahead and thank our amazing panel, uh, Allison Sheridan. Thank you so much for joining us. Where do we find you? Thanks for letting me be on the show here. Uh, uh, Podfeet.com is the best place to find me. I'm Podfeet everywhere. Uh, Darren Kitchen, where? Now that you're back, you're back to uh, traipsing around the globe, where can people find you? Uh, Hack5.org, as always, that's H-A-K, the number five. And we've got a big event coming up on the 20th of October in San Francisco. So if you're interested in any of that Hack5 gear, check it out. You'll find details on our social media. What's, What's the event? It's the Hack5 gear event. The gear event? What are you, what are you guys announcing? Uh, Break some news. The packet squirrel. It's, it's nuts. <laughs> Stop it. I like it already. <laughs> 
Jeff just lit up like a Christmas tree after hearing that pun. Uh, uh, Jeff, uh, where, where can we find more of you? You can follow me on Twitter. I'm at Jeff Kanata, which is spelled with two N's and one T. I do a lot of shows. The one I'll just mention right now uh, is a comedy science show that you might like. It's only 20 minutes. It's called We Have Concerns. You can find it at weaveconcerns.com. Hilarious show. Oh, very, 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 very good. Uh, and of course, you can find me uh, at Justin R. Young on Twitter. I do too many podcasts. That's really, that's really my problem. Uh, I want to thank everybody uh, for coming out and producing this show here at the LA Podcast Festival. Uh, and uh, a thank you to the uh, LA Podcast Festival itself for uh, hosting us. A reminder that our uh, email address is feedback, feedback at Daily Tech News Show. Uh, dot com. We're live Monday through Friday at 4.30 uh, p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, that is, uh, yeah, you can also find us at Al Heat Radio and Dominoclub.tv. Our website is DailyTechNewsShow.com. And I'll be back on Monday, but I'll be broadcasting from Old Blighty with Sarah Lane joining him online. Until next time, this is DTNS. Woo! Press multitasking, sir. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> Boom! That was fun. Thank you, LA! Thank you, Woo! Steve! <laughs> no autographs. Calm down. Lamps, <laughs> <laughs> how else are you going to keep them? your whole life. Like, <laughs> you ruined <laughs> Okay, I have one other thing I need to test out. And people with the cameras can tell me, ow, don't do that anymore, or not. Ow, not. Hi, you're the camera guy? Yeah. Tell me. Too hot? Only if you want to see. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've got an auto adjustment, so it's fine. Okay. They're all do you guys want it? Lights. They're Whatever makes video better, right? Right. A little dimmer. Yeah, right you're looking shiny. That's good. Yeah, it's, it's not bothering me at all. That works. That works. Cool. And I hate bright lights. Awesome. Came from Chicago says, clearly caught you sitting on the top chair for feet up on the desk, basking the power and glory of the DTNS throne. Oh, you got one phone? No. I'm using my phone. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Mine's like Dr. Lost the Lord. Yeah. Look at our Michaela 7 Plus. Yeah, I see it. I wonder what password is, though. Let me ask one password. <clears throat> I'm letting Darren Kitchen on my network. Is this a good idea? Yeah, on Windows box. And it's Windows? I don't even let Windows on my on my uh, home network. You'd be proud of that. Is my light a little too bright for you? Oh, hey, there's me. There's me. Sorry. Oh, wait, is there any That's right, there's no one else in here. Oh, that's pretty much it. The only thing on this thing is Photoshop. No one else is in here? Is there no audience? That's right, they said 5 o'clock on the website. Okay, we do have a laugh track though, right? I'll do it. Maybe they're keeping the big line at the door and not letting them in. Yeah, it's going to be a dramatic moment for us when they all flooded looking for their tech news. <laughs> Where's my tech news? What the f***? Uh, we did a, a live show at PAX last month, and um, we had this big auditorium for We Have Concerns, and uh, Anthony comes in, I was sitting already up on the dais, Anthony comes in, he's like, I don't see a line. Every, like, every year there's a line, and I was like, oh, he's like, yeah. So then they're like, is it okay to let people in? And we're like, okay. And like three people come, Come in and they sit in the thing, and I start like cracking my pants. And there's this big delay, and then the doors open, and then everybody came in. But those three people were like the special needs, yeah, like, disability. Right. Like, but we no, thought those were like the three people. It's funny because I've heard this from Anthony. Oh, you're right, like, man. Anthony's just like, yeah, well, my career's over. So <laughs> yeah, you're like, like, if, oh, I, I, guess can, if I can't pack a panel and packs, <laughs> then it's all done. We got three people. Fine. All right. I guess I'm just gonna start recording. I'm just start recording your audio. All right. <coughs> so live. Oh, they say we're live. Are we live? Live. We, we have an audience. Should we do? Uh, say yeah, something. Yeah. Smile for the camera. Something. Yeah. Test, test. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's my bad. We're doing something. I'm glad we're uh, being amplified. <laughs> what? Yes, yeah. 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 yeah.
<laughs> We're all gonna go around and say our names and share stuff about ourselves. I'm Allison and I'm Ed. <laughs> what is the, the topic here, bro? Uh, tech news. Tech news. Daily unless tech unless you don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you can tell us what we're yeah, we're, 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 we're we're just, we'll, we'll just be a piano. <laughs> we'll be, who the hell are you people? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, is, no, we, uh, we thought we were going to the starting a podcast thing. That's not this one? That's the, no, that's, that's the next that's, one. That's, that's across the hall. No, oh, no, that's the, no, it's the next one. No. They're going to leave. Coming, I know that. <laughs> yeah, but, but we know okay, that. It's better for the audience. I, 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 I'd rather them oh leave God, now so that they leave halfway through. I awkwardly still yeah. realize. Well, so guys, so <laughs> good luck starting a podcast. Because this is your future. Yeah. <laughs> I got that. <laughs> <laughs> this is all recorded, by the way. Oh, my oh, God. God. Oh, no. <laughs> I want to be a big shot. <laughs> like the other <laughs> podcast festival. Hey, kid, I'll make you a star. Uh, okay, that was worth it right there. That was awesome. Yeah. That was great. <laughs> oh. All right, I'm going to put in two emails. because. <laughs> what are we doing? Oh, we can just bullshit. That's fine. Oh, we got no problem with yeah. all time. No, it's, no, no, no. We're podcast. Yeah. We are professionals. I want to... We'll start in like two minutes. No, let's just clam up as soon as you. Well, I don't know, man. This crowd's getting a little fucking antsy. We gotta, we gotta, we gotta ride it, man. Oh, yeah. Let's see what the language I'm streaming. Oh, are we streaming stuff? So. Oh. I apologize. Jeez. Just. This crowd's getting really far angsty. Far angsty. I like how you changed to antsy as well. Yeah. yeah. That's offensive. <laughs> Uh, Peanut gallery back here. Yeah, we got it. There you go. We got you know Steve. What? If, I, if we get one laugh, <laughs> I'm happy. Happy. it's all worth it. <laughs> if we can get one laugh from, from one person, from one person <laughs> who was the only person in the room. that was, then you've set a minimum goal. <laughs> <laughs> and boy, how have you cleared it? Does right, everybody is watching. Wait, I don't even have the chat run. If everybody's I mad, is it clear that literally nobody's here? <laughs> <laughs> You know what though? I'd rather have nobody than two people. Yeah, that's a good right. point. Yeah, it's so yeah. much better having nobody. I mean, we don't have nobody though. We got Bio yeah. Cow. We got Ken from Chicago. That was Ken's wife. Yeah. Online. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. hundreds yeah. of thousands. Then, almost as if to prove the podcast medium is better, better online. It is. <laughs> yeah, we're counted by bits instead of bytes. It's like eight times as many. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know, uh, I mean, the good news fun. is everybody who's going to that other panel, they can get this show whenever they want. That's, you know, that's true. Download it yeah. on the Wait, you, make a podcast. You, can, you can listen to it whenever you want. Whenever you want. Like. Well, what do you call want. something like that? What kind of device do they have, though? They'd rather have someone tell them how to make a podcast than to literally watch one being Be made. made. <laughs> Maybe I'm not, I'm not, here's here's the All right, this is this is this is real. This is this will be the only like element I'm lying of, of, of bitterness that I'm gonna let slip out. The that panel is the same every year. Every time at every convention. At every convention right. that's yeah. happened since Apple started listing podcasts. Yeah. It's How the do exact I do same yeah. thing. I've done yeah. seven thousand of them. I'm sure. It's been Apparently we should be well, well, then, then, then give, me the, give me the tweet version. Give me the 140 characters of How Do I Podcast. You need to make sure that you're having a good time. Right. Talk about something you would talk about anyway. You got to uh, remember. Yep. Uh, 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 quality, quality wins quality out. Quality is important. Right. So, Not video. Uh, uh, video uh, video's okay, but audio, audio, and then audio. Here, Here's where everybody else, this is where I, I get to be like the James Dean. Passion. Fonzie yeah, Rebel. Passion. Is everybody's like, you know, make sure that you're on like editing. And I go, <laughs> Never read it. <laughs> just be better. Ooh. Just just be better and not say ooms and ahs. They hate that. And everyone's like, what? This is the kind of left word thinking that uh, I've never heard on this panel. Whenever anybody asks me how how to get into podcasting, I say build a time machine and go back to 2006. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And although although I, I, I like to I like to answer this. my saying. Also, by the way, can we just open that door so they can hear a better version of that? <laughs> What you need to know is the microphone is everything. You yeah. have to have the right you're microphone. You're going to want to have anything. Microphone. Just anything. Buy the right microphone. How much did you pay for your microphone? Hundreds. Hundreds. Yes. Right. yes. Totally. You have to. I'm really passion. doing this wrong. Got to yeah. have passion. Yeah. Have passion. I, bought, I bought a Rode Podcaster for like 80 bucks. No, no, no you're wrong. Buy your passion. Yes. Expensive passion money. You can, you can buy actually money. buy experience with expensive microphones. Oh, yeah. sweet. It adds it content. Does, it does. No, it you does. rub it a couple times and old man podcast <laughs> comes back. I'm going to be an old man podcast. 